being here this evening uh, for our special meeting of the NCDEQ Secretary's Environmental Justice and Equity uh, special meeting on cumulative impacts. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order and again thank all of you for being here, both those of you who made it uh, through the traffic to make it here in person and our fellow uh, board members on, uh, on WebEx. Uh, Randy and Naima are both there, we, and uh, William Barbara, uh, all board members uh, are there. We appreciate you being here this evening. Let me uh, open the meeting by <clears throat> reading the ethics statement in accordance with the State Government Ethics Act. It is the duty of every board member to avoid both conflicts of interest and the appearance of conflict. If any board member has any known conflict of interest or is aware of facts that might create the appearance of such conflict with respect to any matters coming before the board today, please identify the conflict or the facts that might create the appearance of a conflict to ensure that any inappropriate participation in that matter may be avoided. If at any time any new matter raises a conflict during the meeting, please be sure to identify it at that particular time. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone uh, that the session is being recorded, uh, and I'd like to also ask everyone uh, uh, to mute themselves if they're on, uh, uh, if they're uh, participating in the meeting virtually, to mute until you are speaking. Uh, and uh, if you have a phone, um, don't let us have to take it from you. Uh, so turn it down or off <laughs> uh, for our meeting. And uh, now we will ask India to uh, call the roll. <clears throat> we don't have it. We can wait till later. We have. We do have a quorum. We got eight people here, so uh, we can move forward and do it at the end. All righty. Um, Jeff Onstead. Uh, William Barber III. Yes. Ron Carter. Able to be here. Jamie Cole. She's no longer on the board. Jamie Cole is no longer on the board. Randy David McDonald. Present. Virtual. Mm -hmm. Dr. Johnson. Present. Dr. Johnson Thompson. Present. Um, Carolina Patrick Amina. Um, Dr. Kamara. Present. Marilyn Mark Robinson. Present. Naima Muhammad. Present. And I can barely hear you. Okay. All right. Um, Ronnie Sadler. Carlos Velasquez. LP Wales. Lamicia Whittington. Present. I think that if people are not right at the computer, they need to either move to the computer or talk with that outside voice because we can, I can barely hear them. Let me speak for myself. We're going to do our best to make sure that you can hear, Ms. Muhammad. <clears throat> Same name, I believe. Roll was just called. I just wanted to say William Barber's present. I think you all may have taken care of that. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, it is now. Uh, we would not. This meeting would not be possible with were it not for uh, a fellow board member, Miss Sherry White Williamson, uh, who has done uh, the bulk of the work to uh, pull this meeting together. And I want to publicly thank her at the outset for. Uh, doing all of the work that on this important topic and getting all of the voices in the room and on uh, virtually to share with us on this, this, this important issue of cumulative impact this evening. Uh, I want to turn it over to you. Thank you formally and let you take us through this meeting. Thank you again. For, thank you for so much um, for the opportunity. And I want to personally thank um, the members of the committee who worked to put this report together. It certainly wasn't an easy job, and there are still a lot of unanswered questions that we hope our presenters tonight will help us answer. 
um, as well as help inform um, the uh, recommendations in the report um, that we plan to submit um, for the committee's consideration and to forward on to DEQ, hopefully, um, within a very short period of time after this meeting. Um, I'm happy to say that we have a couple of, or all of the folks on the committee I consider to be experts in their own way. Um, Charles Lee um, is with the US EPA, has been there for a number of years, and I'm sure many of you recognize Charles's name from his most re famous report, Toxic Waste and Race, which we still refer to even now. Um, Nikki Sheets um, is from New Jersey, um, is with the Center for Urban Environment, but was very instrumental over the last 10 years or so to make sure that the New Jersey um, legislation was passed, and he's still very active, also serves on the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Um, unfortunately, Devon Hall will probably not be able to make us tonight. There's been uh, um, a death in the family. But we were able to convince a friend of ours to substitute for him. So Bobby Jones, who is with Down East Coal Ash um, in Wayne County, will substitute for him to talk about the rural experience. Um, and Ron Ross, who is with the historic West End of Charlotte, has joined us um, virtually. And we'll talk about the experience in urban areas as we talk about or consider cumulative impacts. And finally, but not least, um, Jasmine Washington will join us. Um, she's from the Southern Environmental Law Center. And I need to take this call. This is Charles. Hey, Charles. Are you having trouble here? Well, he doesn't attend me. I can switch him over. Okay, hold on. Let me let you talk to our tech person. You want somebody else to go? Yes, there's somebody else. Mm -hmm. It looks like you need to move to online. Um, sorry for the interruption. Um, Jasmine Washington um, will provide um, her interpretations from a legal perspective um, as a part of this discussion. So since Charles is, Lindy is working with Charles at this point, is Nikki available online now? Okay. Um, um, Jasmine? Yeah, I can go ahead and go. Okay, thank you. You are welcome. <laughs> and just to remind speakers, we'd like for you to keep your comments to 10 minute, minutes so that we'll have time for questions from the panel as well, or questions from the board as well as time for public comment at the end. <clears throat>
well, they will go in one Okay, I'll get started here then. Um, good evening. My name is Jasmine Washington, and I'm an associate attorney at the Southern Environmental Law Center. Um, I want to first thank EJEB for hosting this panel and for asking me to speak. Um, like Sherry said, I will be talking about DEQ's legal authority and obligation to consider cumulative impacts in their permitting decision. Um, so I will mostly be speaking about Title VI tonight. Um, this presentation might be a little familiar to some of you. Um, I did present on this topic last year, but since that time, EPA has come out with a number of new guidance documents, so I'll be covering some of those as well. Um, but I'll first start off talking about Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and why it applies to DEQ's permitting decisions, and then go into what Title VI says about cumulative impacts. Um, so the text of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, I pulled it up on the screen here, um, and I'll go ahead and read it. It says, no person in the United States shall on the grounds of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So later in this act, it also requires every federal agency to develop um, regulations that describe how they will carry out this uh, statute. And so uh, EPA's regulations read, that a recipient shall not use criteria or methods of administering its program or activity which have the effect of subjecting individuals to discrimination because of their race, color, national origin, or sex, or have the effect of defeating or substantially impairing accomplishment of the objectives of the program or activity with respect to individuals of a particular race, color, national origin, or sex. Um, so what all that means is that for any organization, including state agencies that receive federal financial assistance uh, from EPA in this situation, uh, they are not allowed to carry out any of their programs or activities in a way that uh, discriminates against or, or overburdens communities of color or people of color. So now let's talk about why this act applies to DEQ. Um, so you'll see that I've underlined the words federal financial assistance and a recipient. Um, like I said before, this statute applies to anybody that receives money or property from EPA. Um, specifically, before they receive that assistance, they have to provide assurance to EPA that they will comply with Title VI in their programming. And EPA also makes it very clear that if a group receives funding for any of their programs, then they must comply with Title VI across all of their programs and activities. So, in our case, since DEQ receives EPA funding uh, from any of its programs, then they have to comply with Title VI across all their programs and activities. Um, so now looking at why Title VI applies to permitting in particular. So you'll see that I've underlined the words uh, program or activity. Um, simply put, permitting programs are programs. EPA has made it very clear that permitting decisions taken by state agencies funded by EPA are subject to federal civil rights law. That language comes from their 2017 uh, Title VI Compliance Toolkit. <coughs> They've also taken, uh, made final findings of discrimination and preliminary findings of discrimination for cases that were based on uh, state permitting decisions. And so when we look at the text of the statute, the regulation and EPA's guidance and actions, they've made it exceedingly clear that permitting decisions are subject to this law. Um, so uh, next, let's talk about what Title VI says about cumulative impacts in particular. Um, so returning for the last time to the text of the statute, um, you'll see that I've underlined subjected to discrimination and the effects of subjecting individuals to discrimination. So courts and EPA have interpreted these terms to provide broad authority when considering uh, harm under potential discriminatory claims. So under Title VI, there are a few types of discrimination that I'll describe because uh, cumulative impacts comes into play in that realm. So one type of discrimination that we have is intentional discrimination. And that is a type of discrimination uh, that occurs when a state agency, a state agency 
uh, takes an action with the express purpose of causing discrimination. So in that case, a court is really looking for a smoking gun that shows that uh, a state agency acted with the intent of burdening or, dis uh, or harming a community of color. Uh, but what's most relevant here is another type of discrimination known as disparate impact. And under that form of discrimination, intent does not matter. Um, in, in that type of discrimination, all that matters is the end results. So if the end result was a disproportionate harm Thank to you. communities of color, whether the agency intended that result or not doesn't matter. What matters is that a harm resulted from that action and that the recipient didn't act to mitigate that harm. Um, so you've heard me say the word harm quite a bit, and that is because harm is where cumulative impacts come into play under Title VI. So when EPA investigates claims of disparate impact, they look at a number of harms from a number of different chemical and non-chemical uh, stressors nearby. So they will look at the environmental harms, so impacts to local air and water quality, they will look at adverse health effects, so things like asthma rates and cancer rates, and they'll also look at non-health harms, so things like decreased property value or impacts to social or recreational life. And so if these are the harms and the factors that EPA is looking at when they're considering cases of disparate impact or whether discrimination has occurred, then these are the harms that, EPA, that DEQ should be looking at during their permitting process and in making their permitting decisions. Uh, notably and, and very importantly, um, EPA has also made it very clear that Title VI obligations or, or federal civil rights obligations exist separately and distinctly from environmental law uh, and uh, the requirements of environmental law. So in other words, uh, a state agency is not excused or exempted from Title VI because they are complying with environmental laws. Uh, EPA also reiterated that recently in 2022, um, stating that there's an independent obligation to comply with federal civil rights, um, and that includes in permitting decisions. So now I'll get into some of EPA's new guidance. Um, so in August of last year, EPA published their frequently asked questions on environmental justice and civil rights permitting. Um, in December of last year, EPA published their principles for addressing environmental justice and air permitting. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that document, but in that document, they provide best practices for permitting agencies to make sure that they're addressing and handling um, environmental justice concerns throughout their air permitting programs. But most recently, EPA in uh, this past January, January 2023, released an addendum to their 2022 legal tools for advancing environmental justice. So diving a little bit into those, um, so frequently asked question number 12 um, from that August frequently asked questions document expressly states that in determining whether a, a recipient's actions cause discriminatory impact, EPA will consider the cumulative impacts from other chemicals and non-chemical stressors. In their January publication, uh, the or EPA reiterated that the effects referenced in the text of Title VI uh, uh, provides authority for them to consider cumulative impacts in investigating claims of discrimination. And uh, staying on this document a little longer, uh, this document, this 2023 uh, addendum uh, with the legal tools to advance environmental justice covers a lot more than Title VI. In this document, EPA actually walks through environmental statute by environmental statute, and they cite and, and, and go into the provisions in those statutes that provide the legal authority for them to consider cumulative impacts. So um, they dig into most federal environmental laws, including the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, um, and hazardous and toxic waste management acts. Um, lastly, I want to touch on DEQ or yeah, DEQ's own uh, environmental equity policy. So this was a policy that at that time um, DNAR released in 2021, where they set the goal um, to address environmental environmental equity issues in permitting decisions for projects potentially having a disparate impact on communities protected by Title VI, and they also set a goal to develop guidelines for assessing the cumulative effects of permitting facilities. 
Um, this policy has not been revoked by DEQ, and it demonstrates that DEQ recognizes its authority to consider cumulative impacts in their permitting decisions. Um, in addition to the, the legal authorities that I've already covered tonight, um, I've also listed a few more authorities that provide or, or, or state that there's an obligation for DEQ and other recipients to consider cumulative impacts in permitting decisions. Um, and wrapping up here, I just have three takeaways. Um, firstly, that DEQ is bound by Title VI in their permitting programs. Um, second, that Title VI has its own legal obligations that are separate and distinct from obligations under federal and state environmental law. And lastly, that Title VI requires DEQ to consider and mitigate cumulative impacts. So I ask that EJEB advise DEQ that they are required to consider cumulative impacts of their permitting decisions on community as a color in order to comply with Title VI. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have an immediate question? Okay, let's, thank you. We'll save questions until the end. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Washington. At this point, we'll start back at the beginning. Um, Charles Lee has been able to join us now, um, and I'm thrilled to have Charles here because he carries a lot of the history of cumulative impacts and EPA with all of the work that he's done. So, Charles, I'll turn it over to you at this point. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you, Sherry. I'm sorry I couldn't get in um, earlier. Um, so should I advance the slides or should you? Can advance them for you. India can okay. advance them for you. Is it possible for me to do it? Oh. So you've okay. you already it's have already loaded, so it's more efficient just to move forward. Okay, okay. if you'll just let them, they'll advance them for you. I'm sorry. They'll advance them for you. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and um, I think. Um, uh, I, I am going to um, try to provide you an overview of uh, the issue of cumulative impacts as it evolved um, in the EJ space and um, in terms of how EPA is um, uh, trying to address that. Uh, so next slide. So I think um, I want to start with some words about why cumulative or the issue of cumulative impact is important. Um, as we all know cumulative impact is the holy grail of environmental justice, and there are uh, systemic factors in society that drive, uh, that have driven the disproportionate concentration of environmental burden from people of color, indigenous and low-income communities. There's numerous, numerous examples of this. Um, and um, uh, this pattern uh, of um, disproportionate concentration is um, both incontrovertible and, and unacceptable. Uh, these result from many factors, including a siloed uh, and fragmented approach towards environmental protection, lack of attention towards um, the distribution of um, impacts of, um, of environmental burden and vestiges of systemic racism and historic discrimination in land use uh, decision making. Next slide. So, like I said, there's a long history to this, um, and um, the issue of cumulative impacts, as we all know, uh, first appeared uh, in uh, federal law in the, um, in the national. Un uh, through CEQ guidance in 1978 from, uh, for the National Environmental Policy Act. But the, um, the, in, in the mid-2000s, uh, uh, in 2005 specifically, um, the EJ um, Advisory Committee for California EPA uh, came out with a definition of cumulative impacts that was informed by a community uh, uh, strong community input, and that concept of, was also uh, linked to this idea of um, pursuing precautionary approaches. Uh, this, of course, led to uh, town virals, uh, uh, um, the um, uh, California EPA adopting um, a uh, uh, a um, 
a, a, a report uh, called Cumulative Impacts Building a Scientific Foundation uh, and became the basis for um, uh, Cal, uh, Cal Enviro Screen, which is the first of many state mapping tools that, uh, that look at cumulative impacts. Um, this is followed by um, state legislation in this area, uh, beginning in Minnesota, which began to look at cumulative impacts in the um, in um, in permitting. Um, and this is uh, uh, there's now a number of states that uh, have have uh, um, adopted uh, legislation in this regard, uh, which I will speak to. Uh, uh, most recently, um, uh, uh, Chicago's Department of Public Health uh, did a, um, uh, a analysis of the general iron RMG uh, Southside Recycling uh, uh, permit, um, and uh, which resulted in the denial of the permit through the use of a health impact assessment. Uh, I think it's really important to look at uh, the New Jersey. Um, forthcoming red, uh, or New Jersey uh, regulations around um, around um, considering cumulative impacts uh, uh, as a result of their legislation. Um, uh, Massachusetts is now uh, issuing um, proposed regulations around uh, cumulative impacts, uh, and there are other uh, attempts at to, uh, addressing cumulative impacts. Um, uh, which are much more community based and uh, collaborative problem solving in nature, like in California and in Minneapolis, and uh, uh, efforts around what they call green zones. Next, uh, so uh, EPA, and I think the previous speaker spoke a little bit about this, um, has, um, uh, has uh, uh, made a big commitment towards. Uh, research in the area of cumulative impacts in the October of last year, the research is um, uh, uh, release a report of recommendations for research in the cumulative impacts area, um, and um, uh, that was the result of that came out as a result of a lot of um, engagement with communities with. Uh, States and tribes, uh, and with with EPA's programs. At this point, there's something. Uh, this is to inform um, EPA's strategic uh, research action plans. Uh, at this point, there's some 94 projects focused on cumulative impacts. Next slide. Um, this was touched on before. Um, and there's a number of um, EPA has done a review of its legal authorities to advance. Um, uh, uh, environmental justice uh, and uh, re most recently um, uh, issued a, set, a compendium of uh, cumulative impacts authorities uh, uh, throughout all its uh, various authorities. Um, basically, it says that the EPA has um, uh, there's a, um, a, a, a a wide purview in terms of uh, assessing for cumulative impacts. And the specific manner in, uh, in which EPA can act on them is going to be uh, defined by the specific statutory context. Um, uh, next uh, slide. And, and, and last, EPA made a commitment through its equity action plan to develop a comprehensive framework for considering cumulative impacts and operationalizing that framework. Next slide. So EPA defines cumulative impacts as the totality of exposures to combinations of, of chemical and non-chemical stressors and their effects on health, well-being, and quality of life. Um, this is uh, a, a definition which I think really ref uh, reflects uh, the, the way communities look at uh, cumulative impacts in terms of um, their, uh, the totality of their lived experience and total burden. Um, next slide. One of the things that uh, so next slide. This is just a, um, a conceptual diagram of how of the multiple influences on the total environment uh, in terms of the built natural and social environments um, and um, how they um, come together uh, in, uh, uh, in in affecting health. 
health and well-being. Uh, it's our slide. So one of the uh, most important things in environmental justice about these definitions is that they begin to point out uh, the relationship between the concentration and distribution of environmental burdens and benefits. Um, and this is the um, relationship between disproportion and cumulative impacts as shown by uh, two um, examples. One is, uh, uh, this is uh, the, uh, on the left is the um, uh, graphic of, uh, uh, from uh, toxic waste and erase attorney where you show that when the uh, numbers of facilities increase in a particular community, uh, the uh, people of color percentage of the population uh, increases dramatically. And on the right is this uh, famous graphic that comes out of the state of New Jersey, uh, which shows how uh, the correlation between um, uh, uh, environmental stressors and people of color and low income populations. Uh, next slide. Charles, we have, you have about two minutes left. Okay, so um, I'll just I'll just wrap up wrap it up here. Uh, one of the key concepts that we have um, for cumulative impacts is uh, this idea of fit for purpose, and this um, uh, is shown by this graphic, which shows shows that um, you know we have been addressing or uh, assessing for cumulative impacts in a lot of our decision making, uh, particularly in the beginning. Uh, and now being used for uh, uh, a number of um, resource allocation decisions uh, in a uh, pretty significant way. Uh, we're now moving into the part, in the green part of this uh, slide, that that is um, uh, uh, around um, and I think um, I think I have a lot more in this, uh, Sherry. So why don't I just stop there for now? Thank you, Charles. Um, we'll hold questions until the end, so everyone will have a chance to present, and then we'll have questions from the the board um, here. Thank you again. Um, the next presenter is Nikki Sheets. And Nikki will talk more specifically about the New Jersey experience. Hey. Hi, everybody. Jerry, thanks for inviting me to do this. And I'm going to try to share screen. I've been having some technical difficulties, so keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, this is not... Oh, we're here. You all seeing this? We no. we don't see anything on the screen. Um, they're trying to do something from this end to see if we can figure it out. Hold on a minute. He's not sharing. He's not sharing. Are you sharing your screen, Nikki? Um, let me go back. Okay. I think I am. Right now, it's not doing anything, anything when I click it, though. Sharon, can you walk in? He has control. Um, oh, he has control? He okay. has control, but it, we're not seeing his share. Okay. Oh, hold on. So you're not you're not seeing this? No, not at all. Well, why don't I Do you talk you through? I was about to say, why don't you just talk us through it, and then we'll figure out the technology and get the presentation to everybody later. Thank okay. you. All right. So even though you won't see it, I'll be looking at the slides. Okay. <laughs> <Those are> the... <laughs> All 
<laughs> so, so my name is Nikki Sheets. For full disclosure, uh, I work at uh, Kane University in New Jersey, but I'm also a member of the grassroots DJ movement. I run a policy center um, at Kane University. I have a background in both law and science. And so I use that background to try to help the EJ community develop the best possible public policy from an EJ perspective. But I, I do that from the inside of the EJ, EJ movement. Um, and cumulative impacts uh, is an issue that we've been working on for years, starting way back um, in 2007, when we decided, we being um, my home environmental justice organizations, New Jersey EJ Alliance. I'm a member of, of several national and regional coalitions also. But in New Jersey, we decided that if anybody, if cumulative, cumulative impact was gonna be addressed, then we had to do it. And so we started a committee then in 2007. It had other people outside of New Jersey EJ Alliance. And we started uh, working on the issue um, that eventually led to one of the graphics that Charles just showed you, which I was going to show you again. <laughs> I've become infamous or famous, however you want to look at it, for showing the graphics. It shows that in New Jersey, um, the amount, the estimated amount of pollution in neighborhoods uh, is strongly correlated with race and income. And of course, it's not in, just in New Jersey. If other states did similar studies, they have similar findings. And in fact, one of the things that started the EJ movement in the late 1980s were several national studies, Charles did one of them, um, that showed that had similar findings. So when we see, when we saw this graph and saw the high correlation between race income and the estimated amount of pollution in the Jersey neighborhoods, um, of course, for us, that started us um, down the policy road. And we said, well, what kind of policy can we develop to address this issue? Particularly, as Charles said, in the, um, in the permitting arena. Um, and that has been, I said often, the holy grail of the EJ movement. How do you integrate cumulative impacts into permitting? And we came up with several solutions. We actually developed a municipal ordinance, but we also developed a statewide ordinance um, uh, at that time also. Um, and we and we campaigned around um, both of them. And um, in 2012, uh, initially a law, a cumulative impacts law was brought in New Jersey um, by the senior female senator in New Jersey. And uh, it surprised us because she hadn't consulted with us, but it must have been motivated by us But we because we were the only ones talking about cumulative impacts at that point. Uh, but it didn't go anywhere. We supported it, but it didn't go anywhere um, at that time. Fast forward to 2017, when Senator Booker, who's our senator, came to us with a national EJ bill. And it did not include cumulative impacts. So we said, well, if you're going to do a national bill on, cum on uh, environmental justice, cumulative impacts should be in it. And we sent over our statewide cumulative impacts policy which, um, to their credit, uh, Senator Booker, he sent it over to the Legislative Council's office. They actually incorporated our statewide cumulative impacts policy into the bill. Um, it, was, it was a slight variation of our statewide policy, but the important thing was that, um, as our policy said, uh, under certain circumstances, um, uh, the bill did, did say that pollution permits, applications for pollution permits should be denied. The bill submitted in Congress, it didn't go anywhere, but one reason why we supported uh, the bill, and this was in the time when President Trump was in office, is we thought it would continue the conversation on EJ, cumulative impacts on both the state and national level. And that in fact is what happened in New Jersey. Uh, a Senator in South Jersey, Senator Singleton, one of our heroes now, um, picked up the cumulative impacts fight. We're pretty sure that the reason that he activated the fight again was because of the national work um, we were doing with Senator Booker and the, and the bill that Senator Booker submitted to Congress. 
and uh, Cinder Singleton um, uh, develop uh, EJ and Cumulative Impacts Law um, in New Jersey. And so the guts of that law, um, which was adopted in 2020, the guts of the law starts by identifying uh, what the law calls what the law calls overburdened communities. When it says any black group that is there is at least 40% uh, of color or 35% low income or who's, who, where 40% of his residents are of limited English proficiency, any one of those three criteria, law defines that as an overburdened community. In the EJ movement, we would call, we would call these EJ communities because there's no environmental indicator um, as a criteria of being labeled overburdened community. But then the law does bring in environmental indicators. It then says, if you're going to ask for a major pollution permit in one of these um, communities, and this is done by block group, by census block group. So if you're gonna ask for a major pollution permit in one of these communities, then you have to perform an EJ analysis. And if that EJ analysis shows that by granting the permit, cumulative environmental and health stressors would be higher in the block group that would host the proposed facility than in other block groups in the state. Then if you're asking for a new <laughs> permit, if you're asking for a new permit and granting the permit will cause these cumulative health and environmental stressors to be higher, then that permit shall be denied. If you're asking for a permit that would um, enlarge a facility or a permit that's a permit renewal, even if granting that permit will cause cumulative health and environmental stress to be higher in the host community than other communities, the permit won't be denied, but conditions can be placed, can be placed on that permit. And so that was, it was a, a breakthrough, a huge breakthrough, because that was the first law um, that was adopted that said that under certain circumstances, Pollution permit applications shall be denied based on cumulative impacts and environmental justice. The bill from Senator Booker's office was the first that we know of, um, at least that, that said that, but it was not adopted. This bill was the first one that was, uh, that was adopted. So it's groundbreaking since 2020, where we've been waiting for the regulations to come out. Uh, we, we being New Jersey EJ communities and others, but worked uh, closely with New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection to develop those regulations. Regulations will set the universe of environmental and public health structures, you know, what are they? And it will say how to perform this EJ analysis. And it is set to come out in about two weeks. So stay tuned. Uh, right now, the uh, press conference is set for April 11th. I think um, I think the regulations will be submitted. I think April the third, um, and 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 uh, be available for the public a couple of weeks a couple of weeks later. So we are we are anxiously awaiting that. Uh, we're very proud of the legislation and the regulations right now. We think they're going to make an impact. But we also say that, that they're not a silver bullet. Right? We think that there are gonna have to be other laws and regulations um, to address disproportionate pollution burdens. And I would uh, argue to you that, oh, I'm at 11 minutes, so I'm gonna stop right now. Uh, I, I'll make that argument later if you wanna hear it. But we do think that, there, that this law is gonna have to be combined with other laws and regulations. We've coined the term that we need cumulative policies to address cumulative impacts. Um, but this is an important first step. So if you want to ask me uh, questions about the regulation of the laws, uh, I would love to entertain those questions. Thank you. And sorry, you, for the, um, sorry for the technical difficulties. Thank you so much, Nick, and we'll hold questions until the next two presenters. Okay. Um, we have next uh, on the agenda Bobby Jones, who will talk a little bit about cumulative impacts from a rural perspective. 
And after that, Ron Ross will talk about um, cumulative impacts from an urban perspective. Bobby is from Down East Coal, Ash and Wayne County, North Carolina. Good evening. Thank you for me this opportunity to share some information about cumulative impact in um, Eastern North Carolina. Um, Rural Eastern North Carolina is um, inundated with hay folks. They include hog farms with complementary um, bird farms. More than 30,000 birds in some, with less than 30,000 birds. The HF Lee Polash plant that, that gener generates electricity for Duke Energy burnt coal from 1950 till 2012. 2012, present. Burning methane or natural gas. Burning the coal ash for more than 60 years have resulted in over 6 million tons of poisonous coal ash. The coal ash is not disposed of or stored appropriately. Instead, it was stored above ground in unlined pits are hidden by being submerged in water to create the illusion, the illusion of a lake, a pond. I know about those ponds because as a young man, because we could not afford to go to the beach, like a lot of other people in my community, we recreated at the coal ash pond. Myself, my father, my brother, my siblings, people, other people in the community would go down and we'd play in the water, swim. Yes, we would even fish, take the fish on and we'd eat those fish. Myself included, like I say, we, re we recreated down uh, in the coal ash pond. In addition to coal ash being routinely released into the ground, onto the ground, leading into the groundwater, and being released in the Noose River, and even poison drinking water. Several members of our community got letters from the state toxicologists telling them not to drink the water because it was poison. Several members of our community had to go and bottle water for about three years. The energy was gracious enough to pay for that bottled water. In addition to the water going into the news, being released into the news for all those years, in 2016, when Hurricane Matthew and again in 2018, the Hurricane Flood, there were breaches and poisonous coal ash got released into the community. And then once again, getting into the water and into the Noose River. And we have continued to live with the coal ash. Add insult to injury. We now have to com contend with more, another kind of pollution. You know um, that plant located in a flood zone, and our community were, were happy that we didn't have to worry about another facility being burned build because you don't build in a flood zone. Well, somehow with their magic and their unlimited capital were able to come in and, and then it would declare no longer being in a flood zone. And 
March the 21st, 2021, to celebrate the opening house for a facility that we burn the already existing coal ash. Mind you that this coal ash has been in the ground for over 50 years. Some of it has been in the ground for over 50 years. It has taken on a lot of carbon. They had found a market, a market for it through the concrete industry, where they could burn, reburn that coal ash. And once they burned the carbon out of it by ash, they could resell that to the people. You know, rural eastern North Carolina is, is inundated, like I say, with, with CAFO. All forms, as well as the, the bird, bird farms. They have to have over 30,000 birds before they, they were, have any kind of oversight. So there, there are some farms that don't have that. But they still produce waste. And some of them have antibiotic uh, digesters. And the folks have those two. Deal with well, they put a cover over the lagoon, if you will, and capture some of the methane. But they can't capture all of it. They capture some of it. And you know what happens to methane that's not captured? People that live in my community breathe. Yeah. So the exacerbate our carbon imprint. Now it seems like everyone understand that they if under the guise of generating natural gas or generating elect electricity, they can, they can use these digesters now. And they're popping up all over Eastern North Carolina. And I talk, let me talk a little bit about um, one of the hog farms in Warren County, part of the hog farm. They have a, a digester, and instead of just putting the hog waste in it, they started putting lunch meat, old lunch meat, out of date lunch meat, and that type of stuff from Smithfield into the digester. That wasn't enough. They started putting whole animal carcasses into the digester. What happened? Exploded, it exploded and it erupted, if you will. So 30,000 gallons of that toxic, poisonous mixture overflowed into the surrounding, I call them the lungs of my swamp. And the sad thing about it is Department of Environmental Quality was aware of the tear in early February. And this occurred. Bobby, you have two minutes left, please. Okay. Another example is us working with a group in, in uh, Greenville to try to prevent a boat making company from being made because it released poisonous siren gas. Uh, this boat making company had a five year history from their parent company in Tarboro of uh, violating air permits. Okay. And we did the research and we saw all the cumulative data. All of them were bad. It was in an old, established black community. Where they wanted to build the facility, what was right across the street from a from a um, head start for facility for, for, for his uh, for wage program, and right beside that was a was a uh, aquatic and, and rec center for uh, 
geriatric individuals. In addition to that, this company has been already producing, building boats and releasing this poison into the air for a year. But guess what? The Department of Environmental Quality is still granted them a permit. So, uh, right now, cumulative impact doesn't mean, doesn't appear to mean anything, does not afford any protection to the people in our community and, and other other communities in Eastern North Carolina. I'll cut it there since I'm running out of time. Thank you so much for the presentation. And I have to particularly thank Bobby because he's a replacement for someone else. I talked with him this afternoon and he agreed to come and talk from this perspective. Um, and the last presenter is Mr. Ron Ross, who is from the West End of Charlotte, North Carolina, to talk about cumulative impacts from an urban perspective. Mr. Ross, you are on. Can you unmute yourself, Ron? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening. I'm Ronald Ross, um, neighborhood president of Northwood Estates Community, um, uh, air keeper with Clean Air NC, and also a, a, a member of the historic West End Green District. Uh, next slide, please. Um, air, air pollution is the largest uh, environmental threat to our health. And uh, the leading number, the five leading causes of death I know, are, are lit here. And these are causes of death that adversely affect uh, members of my community uh, due to the air, air pollution that we're uh, exposed to. And this is according to uh, uh, disease, disease control prevention uh, report. Next slide, please. Uh, again, probably most of you are aware of redlining. Again, this is a, a representation of uh, 1935 redlining map of Charlotte uh, uh, that shows uh, uh, the redlining of homes that are located in the red and yellow areas that were uh, not afforded uh, lending by the uh, Federal financial institutions, according to Federal Home Loan, uh, Federal Home Owners Loans Corporation, and people weren't able to improve their homes uh, or, or get any loans for that uh, case. Matter of fact, uh, in 2016, Mecklenburg County uh, declared the area, which we kind of know as as the Crescent, and also that uh, area above this mark indicated there. Uh, is uh, highly populated by uh, blacks and people of, of color. Again, limited educational opportunities um, and so forth, uh, uh, access to medical facilities are, are not prevalent in our communities. And again, the map to the right again shows that what we call the Crescent area, the dark green areas of communities, uh, that are segregated by poverty and, and primarily comprised of black and brown communities. Uh, next slide, please. This is a of uh, Mecklenburg County, which Charlotte is a part of, uh, that shows uh, EPA polluting sites in the in the light blue box areas. And again, that's in that crescent area, the communities that that that, that I represent and, and, and live in. Uh, uh, a lot of toxic releasing types of facilities are, are located in those areas. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these photographs are some of the uh, facilities that are uh, in, in my neighborhood, in close proximity in my neighborhood. The top one is the Martin Marietta Rock Quarry, uh, and that's a picture, that top picture is a graph of the uh, 
of the, of the mining that they do there, the blasting and so forth, uh, continuously uh, to provide the the rock and and, and and so forth that's needed to to build these uh, uh, astronomical buildings that Charlotte is, is getting, and 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 also to build new housing, et cetera, et cetera. And the picture to the left there is denoting the tracks that are traversing in and out of that uh, facility on a daily on a daily basis. Uh, with rock debris, dust, and so forth, pollution that's being emitted, emitted from, from that, they're traversing out in and out of that facility. We're looking at uh, getting some conversation with them to get some community benefits, creating ways that they can reduce uh, pollution uh, from the vehicles that travels in and out of their facility. Uh, one of the things we've approached them about is uh, coming up with ideas as far as water wells so that of the wheels from the trucks as they depart from the uh, from the uh, quarry uh, are able to be uh, watered down and, and not emit the, uh, the that uh, dust and air pollution uh, with into the surrounding community communities. And this next photo is another facility that's in close proximity uh, a, uh, recycling facility again right in our communities. We have diesel equipment. Uh, we have a uh, truck stop and all the diesel uh, emissions that are being emitted there. This bottom photo is uh, from probably about two or three years ago. These are communities that are located uh, along the I-77 interstate. And these were the homes that were uh, open and, and, and accessible to uh, the addition of a toll roads. Again, you got the equipment, the uh, construction equipment, dust, car emissions that, that these communities are, are being exposed to. The communities that, that we live in are surrounded by industrial facilities, freeways, and uh, have a negative impact uh, upon our communities. Uh, there will be another uh, extension of the toll road coming forth, so we, we want to look at ways that those, those uh, impacts can be, be mitigated somewhat as well. Uh, next. Photo, please. Next slide. Uh, again, some of the things we've been able to do are uh, some community monitoring. We use uh, an air beam, which is to the right there, uh, involves uh, utilizing a, a tablet where you can walk around the community uh, and, and uh, in different locations and test the air quality. Uh, again, these these items here below that are is an air purple monitor. Both of them are air purple. Uh, purple air monitors, and these are posted outside the exterior of homes. So we're expanding that so we can uh, do appropriate air quality level testing uh, within, within our communities. Next slide, please. Um, and this photograph is a, a, a this is a purple air map uh, within historic one of the uh, on the purple air monitor within the historic Western monitor. Uh, coincidentally, this was a reading uh, that was uh, reflected yesterday in my neighborhood. My neighborhood is the Northwood uh, neighborhood. There's several uh, monitors in that area. Uh, again, we got a air quality index that's reflected here and it's showing that uh, if you take a look at that, the AQI uh, 101 unhealthy air for sensitive, uh, for sensitive individuals and uh, in contacting, you know, we, we're monitoring air, so we have uh, contact with uh, and do outreach with Mecklenburg County Air. And coincidentally, what happened, there was a uh, prescribed air uh, fire uh, burning at Ladder Park Reserve. And so I know I looked at the monitors early in the morning, everything was, was green, uh, 053 uh, AQI for good readings. Uh, later on in the afternoon, we had these higher uh, readings again. It's a temporary situ situation, but we're looking for outreach uh, and extension of, of information out to the community to know, notify us of these situations so we can, so in the residents can make a determination whether they should go inside and stay for a while or, or determine their outdoor activities. Next slide, please. So over the years, we were able to come up, uh, compare air quality rating uh, readings with uh, South Charlotte, more affluent area of Charlotte with uh, uh, with the historic West End area, of, uh, Northwest Charlotte, and came up with a report comparing that and showed some discrepancies. And uh, we were able to uh, 
do some presentations to county officials, uh, uh, Mecklenburg Air, uh, uh, Mecklenburg uh, Air Quality Department, and, and petition uh, through those meetings with the city council and and, and county commissioners uh, to get a uh, a federal uh, PM 2.5 air quality monitor that's now located in the in the community. So we have uh, real time readings with with that uh, particular instrument. Uh, next slide, please. And I won't go through all this, but this is just a brochure showing some of the uh, some of the the, the, the projects and, and and ways that we're trying to address the uh, these issues and also uh, uh, get the community educated on different uh, ways uh, to uh, to mitigate for uh, and advocate for people air quality and reduce their exposure to these uh, air, air pollutants. Um, next slide, please. So some of the things we wanna do is again, green infrastructure and strategic tree plantings. We've instituted uh, uh, just recently, uh, Wells Fargo Air, uh, Clean Air Garden. Uh, we're looking at uh, getting this uh, pillar that you see here uh, implemented uh, with green vegetation on it. So we have a, a, a indication that when someone's coming in that area, they're in, in the green district and we wanna enhance the area with that, uh, that green infrastructure that it serves as a purpose to reduce uh, air pollution and filter air with uh, tree adoption. We're working with tree uh, Charlotte to, to increase those uh, uh, additions of trees in the community and continue to, to monitor the air. Next Mr. slide. Mr. Ross, you have about a minute left. Sorry to cut you off, but we want All right. to give folks um, We are instituting, we're trying to institute, we are instituting uh, 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 electric uh, vehicle in infrastructure and uh, charging station in infrastructure uh, within the community. We have several already installed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, we want to increase advocacy trainings and take opportunities that we've been able to present over the last year and continue to will continue to do this year. Next slide. So we want to improve the tree canopy. We want to uh, create green buffers along the, uh, the interstate. Uh, there's a need to utilize community-led collection of, of uh, data for federal monitoring to provide economic benefits and career options around EV expansion. We're seeking opportunities for residents to be able to obtain electrical vehicles and get community benefit agreements from uh, from businesses that are taken out of our community, such as uh, Martin Marietta Rock Quarry. Uh, there's a need to provide more access to health resources and provide additional studies around the impacts of this community community resources of pollution that impact our communities. And there's a need for clean construction uh, partnerships. Next slide, please. And thank you so much guys for rushing through, but thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you. Thank you, Mr. Ross. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of our panelists tonight for providing all of this information to us. And at this point, I'll open it up for members of the board to ask any questions that you might have. So, um, my question, and I guess I would project this to um, Charles Lee, as well as Jasmine Washington. I mean, it's good to have this addendum now on cumulative impacts, but if we go back to the Civil Rights uh, Act, Title VI, that's almost 60 years ago, what have been the barriers that have prevented, say, for example, DEQ, as well as EPA, for, from addressing them? I hope this, this won't be me speaking too much out of turn, but um, I, I, I think just sort of... Um, <laughs> Um, a, a, a lack of political drive 
to do it, frankly. Um, there have sort of been small, almost steps made along the way, and, and it's, it's nothing to kind of bring it across the finish line. Other federal agencies like DEQ, uh, 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 DOT, um, you know, has made different types of determination and actually denied funding because of Title VI uh, violations, but EPA just hasn't, um, has not done it, and Oh. The recipients haven't, haven't done it. Thank you, Jasmine. I mean, I sort of thought that, but I just wanted to. I think, I think Charles was about to give Charles, me. Yes, Charles. And how are you doing, Charles? Haven't seen you in a while. I think that, um, you know, the, the new administration has taken on a real, uh, made a real commitment to address cumulative impacts, um, to recognize that. Um, it has been a real barrier uh, in terms of um, achieving equity um, and um, and the um, the um, uh, efforts that I just talked about and there are many more uh, are intended to really move uh, the agency to a place where they are starting to really address this issue. I mean, I think there are issues that have to do. Uh, um, with um, political will, it has issues to do with the way the programs are uh, set up to to work uh, in silos, um, and um, um, and there are real uh, legitimate science and policy questions that have to be addressed. Thank you, Carolyn. Yeah, I question is for um, Dr. Sheets. Um, could you maybe give a couple of examples of the complementary policies that you feel would help um, address um, the concerns of the communities um, that should go along with the cumulative impacts bill that was passed? Yeah, and, and, and let me say in general, um, that uh, I, I, I think there are two types of policies, two different type, at least two different types of policies that can be used to address dis uh, cumulative impacts and disproportionate pollution levels in EJ communities. One type would address it through the concept of cumulative impacts itself. And that's the kind of law we have in New Jersey. Right? It's, it's an explicitly cumulative impact laws, a law says if cumulative stressors uh, will be made higher by granting the permit, then the permit shall be denied. But then I would argue to you that another type um, of law or policy would be uh, a policy that goes to address uh, the different types of pollution that make up disproportionate pollution mode. Right, so you have uh, pollution from different sectors, you have water pollution, air pollution, and one policy that the, we've been pushing for a long time in New Jersey and really um, EJ community around the country, many EJ groups have adopted this, is what we call mandatory emissions reductions or uh, achieving mandatory emissions reductions through climate change mitigation policy. So the idea is fairly simple, uh, although not simple to, to implement. If you have a power plant that's located in an EJ community, or whose emissions detrimentally impact the EJ community, um, and, and it's under a climate change mitigation policy, then that plant will be forced to reduce its emissions. And what we're really after is reduction of the coal pollutants, those other air pollutants that are emitted alone to carbon dioxide. Right? And those coal pollutants, and the one we worry about most is airborne particulate matter, they go into making up the disproportionate pollution load that you uh, see in EJ communities. And why we say, why, we, why, why you have to say that those plants will be forced to reduce emissions is because the predominant climate change policy that's being used now to fight climate change is carbon trading. And carbon trading does not make all plants at all locations reduce emissions. Right? Normally under carbon trading, you would set a goal for a collective of plants. Like in New Jersey, we're under the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And there are, there are 26 plants in New Jersey under that initiative. 
And there's a, a goal that the 26 plants have to meet collectively. So if they meet that goal collectively under carbon trading, if the plant in Newark does not reduce, that's all right under carbon trading. But for EJ people and people that live in Newark, that's not all right, right? We want to force that plant that's in the EJ community that's contributing to the disproportionate pollution load. We want to force that plant to reduce its emissions to get that coal pollutant um, emission reduction. And so that's an example of a policy that we are really pushing that we think will work with the cumulative impacts policy in New Jersey now that will also help to significantly reduce the disproportionate pollution in the EJ community. And by the way, we're, we're, we're engaging EPA on this also, uh, on the federal level and DEP on the state level and urging both of them to institute this kind of policy. Thank you. Did you have a question, Dr. Sarah? I had a bunch of questions. Uh, uh, Don't have a lot of time. <laughs> I know. Uh, for Nikki, I, I just was wondering uh, immediately, uh, what were some of the lessons that you learned? I, I, I have an interest in this. I grew up in part in Camden, New Jersey. What are some wow. of the, exactly. What are some of the lessons that you learned from working on cumulative impacts in New Jersey that we might benefit from immediately in North Carolina? What are some things that we might put into place immediately, particularly in urban areas like Ron? I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. You know, my main message is don't wait for the, for the perfect policy or the perfect cumulative impacts tools. Um, I would disagree with Charles somewhat when he said there's still some policy issues and scientific issues to be worked out. Well, let me put it this way. I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I think we have sufficient policy solutions and sufficient science to do the cumulative impacts. And we got to get off the dime. We got to stop talking about it and we got to move. And that's why New Jersey example is so important. Um, you know, we have tools all over the country now. We have tools, cumulative impact tools in California, in New Jersey, in Michigan. We have a federal tool that approximates a cumulative impact tool. And we shouldn't be waiting for the perfect tool. We can do this. So pick a, what I would say for North Carolina, pick a method, whether it's California, where there's New Jersey to, um, to assess cumulative impacts and embed it in a policy that actually reduces pollution in New Jersey neighborhoods. You know, for a long time, not in New Jersey, in North Carolina neighborhoods, you know, for a long time, the scientists said to us, um, well, we don't have, we, we don't know what happens when you mix the, mix the pollutants, so we can't take action. And, but then we started saying, but, you know, not taking an action is really making a scientific determination, right? You're saying that those, when they mix together, there's no synergistic effects. Um, you're, you're actually, you know, you are making a, a scientific determination. And, you, and while you're, you know, waiting for the perfect, for the science to catch up to the policy, people are dying. And so that, that's my main message. We know how to do this now. We know how to do it, you know, well enough so that it's credible, scientifically credible, um, um, you know, well, I don't know, politically credible, I would argue. And it just has to be the political will to do it at this point. Now, there may be some legal questions you have, whether you have to pass legislation or whether you have the authority to do it now. Um, you know, that's a separate question. But I think that can be resolved, and you just you, you have to take action, or you should take action. Yes, when we when we have inquired with uh, DEQ as to why were people are going and granted a permit, when we clearly had a documentation of cumulative impact, their responses were the statute. We go by stature, and the statute said if they can they can be approved to have this permit. And they can have it. So it's like you got competing, got um, cumulative impact on this side, statue on that side. We've got to make a different fight, like you know, said. Are there any other questions? I, I do have a question, and mine is slightly different. Um, Nikki, I live in a rural area, and I know a lot of the discussion is around urban areas. What kind of recommendations would you have for folks trying to address cumulative impacts in a rural area surrounded by CAFOs and 
all of the other things that we find in, in rural parts of many states? I think, I, I think we have the tools and, and I think you have to explicitly take into account rural and urban areas. But I think, again, the tools are there. I think the California tool does it. I think the New Jersey tool does it. You just have to make sure the indicators um, work for both urban areas and rural er areas. And certainly, you know, surrounded by CAFOs, there would be indicators that, that would work for you. That would work for you there in, in North Carolina. And so I, I you know, I, I think a good, a good tool takes that into account. And, and I think we have the knowledge to do that now. Um, you know, I, I think it does take, I, I, I do think you have to pay attention specifically to rural areas. Make sure your method, methodology, um, uh, you know, works uh, in rural areas as well, as well as urban areas. But, but we, believe it or not, um, New Jersey gets a bad rap. We have rural areas in New Jersey. Just, We're actually yeah, too, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, and, and we think the methodology that New Jersey DEP came up with um, does work in rural areas also. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and we, we appreciate, again, all of our panelists and the time that you have spent with us tonight. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. And let me uh, join Ms. Mark Williamson in thanking all of our guests for an enlightening uh, contribution this evening to this very, very important issue. Um, <clears throat> this is the beginning of a long discussion that we have to continue uh, here. Um, but at this point, because we have a public comment uh, period, I will maintain a motion to adjourn the formal uh, part of our meeting. Could I ask if we could consider um, deciding what we might want to do with the recommendations at this point? Sure. Quickly. I would like to make a motion that based on what we've heard tonight that we take these recommendations and update them to the committee and get it back to the board for um, Submission to the DEQ um, as soon as possible. With the motion, do we have a second? I second. Second, second third, and fourth. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. Now I will obtain a motion for adjourn the phone. So moved. Second. We move the final second that we adjourn the meeting and now turn to the public comment section. Uh, of our meeting, uh, I believe we have uh, five people uh, who wish to speak, who have signed up to speak. Um, Ms. Bryant will announce the names in the order in which the requests were received. She will also announce that who's on deck to uh, comment. And everyone will have two minutes to provide their comments. Uh, and please take note of the time remaining signs and stop when your time has come to a close. Thank you, and now Ms. Bryant. Okay, so we have a few names that are online that have already signed up um, previously before the meeting. Um, when I call your name, please press star three to raise your hand and then star six to unmute. Um, the first person we have is Stephen Norris. Stephen Norris, if you're online, can you please raise your hand by pressing star three? Um, Belinda Joyner. You're being requested to unmute. Belinda, can you unmute, please? Belinda? Hi, um, as I sit here and listen to all that's been said tonight, it, it sounds like, you know, back in the day, um, the Four Tops made this song. It's the same old song, mm -hmm. and we've been singing it for a long time. And my question is, how much more information do you have to give to DEQ and DAQ that they don't already have. 
You know, we're still spinning the wheels going around and around and nothing is happening. And I, as I listened to Nikki, um, if these other states can consider cumulative impacts, and I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey, but I don't want to go back to New Jersey to uh, breathe some different air. Different air. Um, my thing is, how do we hold DEQ and DAQ accountable? Because we, we get the same results, which is nothing. So my thing is, uh, right now, we, we have a hog farm in Northampton County, and they want to rezone for biogas. And there's nothing that's going to make me believe that that permit won't be granted, even though we are impacted by Enviva. Um, we have the hog farms. We would have had the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, the whole nine yards. So wh where do we go from here? Because these meetings and, and this talking, I, you know, I, I'm not seeing any results from it, and I've listened to it for the last three, four, five years, and we, we're still at the same place that we were then. So what recourse do we have or how can we um, go forth with DEQ or DAQ and hold them accountable for issuing these permits because they say as long as they're in compliance, then they have to grant their permit, not counting the, 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 the impact that it's having on the communities that are breathing this and living this every day. So when does it stop and when does it stop? Thank you for your comment. Um, the next person on the list is Omega and Brenda Wilson. Omega Wilson, I think we just unmuted you. Uh, I'm glad to see uh, Dr. Sheets on. Dr. Sheets and I communicated for quite a few uh, months, years relative to uh, the um, implementation of the Kimberly Intact Law for New Jersey, right? We also communicated with uh, Senator Cory Booker on the Environmental Justice for All bill, right? We, in fact, provided some specific input relative to it not having uh, language about right to basic public health amenities, safe drinking water, sewer, et cetera, right? And it wasn't included in the bill, even though it wasn't passed. The question I have for Dr. Sheets is, we know that the Southern politics is not New Jersey politics. When you start talking about policy, North Carolina is a red state legislatively. And a lot of people may not clearly understand that policy means state legislative law. What you got was state legislative law. How we get that approved in North Carolina is another question. So I think the question is how we move that forward without state legislative law with a red political legislature. Of course, Charles know what I'm talking about. I've been knowing Charles for almost 20 years and worked with him with EPA um, on NEJAC. The other part of this is for the lawyers in the room, is there's a, there's a third rail to this relative to policy versus following the plan of California or the states, which are not law in North Carolina. It's where the legal leverage comes for filing formal legal actions because some communities have found a faster track with that and more positive responses with that rather than looking for the state legislature or DEQ to implement to get measurable outcomes. So if you have a moment to speak to that, I think that question needs to be answered rather than our just making public comments. Thanks a lot for being here. It's good to see both of you on the panel. Thank you for your comment. Next is Kay Rabel. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, my name's Kay Rebold, and I'm a member of the Alliance to Protect the People and Places We Live, otherwise known as Apple. I'm here today to express my deep concern that many environmental justice communities suffer from multiple sources of pollution in their areas. Cumulative impact must be considered in permitting decisions from DEQ and other agencies. 
In the past few years at hearings and public meetings, we've heard the countless voices of citizens like we've heard tonight, crying out with suffering because of poor air and water quality from hog waste lagoons, the burning of chicken waste or the toxic fumes from wood pellet operations. These dirty industries are often located in close proximity to one another, intensifying the conditions that cause poor health and illness for people in the community. A new executive order must take into consideration the cumulative impact and take steps to ensure that cabinet agencies and other regulatory bodies stop rewarding dirty industries in their permitting actions that are causing harm to the climate, the environment, human beings, and the life community. Thank you. Yes, I'm here, not online. Um, so want me to speak. Good evening. My name is Rania Masri. I'm a director at the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here on such a critical topic. I have two very quick points to make. Um, it's important to recognize the legal need and the legal directive for DEQ to look at cumulative impact, but it is also the ethical aspect and the only logical aspect when allowing for permits or even looking at what should or should not even be permitted. And from we look at DEQ and we wonder who's actually guiding DEQ. How did we get to a stage where we have poultry industries that are operating without even the need for a permit? where poultry industries can operate and get rid of their poultry waste without even reporting it. So I ask you to recognize when we talk about cumulative impact that DEQ should also look at what is not being permitted and needs to be permitted. And second, I want to second a statement made by Dr. Nikki Sheets, where he said cumulative policies are needed to address cumulative impacts. Therefore, in looking at cumulative impact, it would be fantastic if we can also consider what these communities lack, the health access and availability, the schools, their income level, these also should be taken into consideration when we look at cumulative impact. My second point is for you, the board. What will you do when DEQ chooses to ignore your recommendation? What timeline will you give to DEQ? What power will you demand from the governor? What power will you demand from the EJ community in North Carolina? We need you to do more than simply offer recommendations to DEQ that unfortunately we're pretty sure they're going to ignore. Are all, that is all of our um, uh, those signed up for public Dr. Sheets, you, got, you had a, a question from Mr. Wilson. Uh, do you want to uh, respond to, to his question? I thought it was a very good, provocative question. I think it is a very good, pro provocative question. I don't have a good, provocative answer. Um, I think, and, and by the way, I'll say, um, Omega, when, when we were doing the EJ bill with Senator Booker, um, Omega was a key part of the national EJ community that we reached out to and had, I don't know how many calls we had, Omega, we had a whole lot of calls to give input into that into that bill. But I think, um, I, I don't wanna pun on it, but I'll say, I, I think it's a, a, a local organizing question. Do you think it would be easier to actually get state legislation passed? Or do you think um, it would be easier to look at your existing laws and, um, and examine whether you think there is legal authority there in um, North Carolina statutes to uh, address cumulative impacts. And I, I will say, we, we have still a running argument in New Jersey. Um, what we were gonna do, because that, that, that was the position of New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection that they did not have the authority to address cumulative impacts, which we disagree with. And we were on the verge of forming um, a, a legal committee uh, in New Jersey 
of you know all the EJ lawyers we could find, and environmental lawyers, and 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 examine the question when uh, the New Jersey bill was put together by Senator Singleton, and we didn't have to go through that process. But you were still here, New Jersey DEP say they did not have the authority to address cumulative impacts before we had the bill. Um, but you were here, the EJ community. Um, you know, we still don't. You know, we still say we think they had the had the authority to address cumulative impacts. But it became a moot point when the state legislation uh, was was put together. So you have some great EJ organizers there. Yeah, I, I, I hear them speak tonight, and and I think um, you know they they can probably best address that issue. I will, I will speak from ignorance and say, uh, so much of this I thought was already in place. So much of this I thought was already part of our legal system. So I often wondered why things had gone through permitting and were able to get through without uh, this uh, as an effort. It sounds like, um, I remember being in a conversation recently uh, about housing in Charlotte, and one of the things that came up uh, when we talked to the city council and the uh, the mayor's office, one of the things they said is, well, we can only do what you push us to do. So one of the things I might say is uh, we will be helped as a EJ board if the people push us, uh, if we're given more effort uh, and more of an argument to make by the needs of the people uh, as well. And uh, I think we could probably say that some of us will work to push that as well. So thank you. <laughs> Okay, I, you know, I, I appreciate what the Reverend has said, but we are, as well as the speaker, we are an advisory board. We do not have the power uh, to tell DEQ what to do. That's the first thing. When you look at DEQ and you look at EPA, they are very... Uh, very similar in that they have controlling, they have controlling bodies, DEQ, the legislature, EPA, the Congress. Why, I'm, I'm just wondering, and so when I think about that, I think about how many changes have taken place in this country. I've been here for a long time. And it's basically been through the ballot box. <laughs> Is there an effort to go to the people you vote for that you put into office? Is that an option? So I'm just throwing that out for thought. Wow, this is Naima. Can I speak? Yes. 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 Okay, so. Um, was that Marion just speaking? Yes, Naima. Okay, how are you? Anyway, yes, uh, just in in kind of in line with and in response to that question, I mean, to your statement, that's been a question we've had for years in all of the communities I've worked with. And what we have found is that the, the representatives that's sitting up in Raleigh right now, we don't have it. We mean the black communities don't have anybody up there that's really representing mm -hmm. us. They might be from our districts, and but they don't represent us. And they've shown that. They've shown themselves to be more in line with these corporations than they are with the people that they're supposed to represent. We've had direct opposition from our elected officials there in response to our advocacy against the, uh, some of the environmental harms that we've experienced, in particular, the pork industry. And, you know, we fight in our communities against these things, and then the policymakers will pass a bill to shut down in the opposition that, we, uh, that we've had. And we saw that specifically in 2016 and 2017, when they passed the two bills 
uh, House Bill 467 and Senate Bill 711. Was, and those were representatives sponsoring those bills that were supposed to be representing the people that were being harmed and the people that went to them uh, asking for them to do something about what was happening to them. And they passed laws to shut down any opposition and really strip people of the right to redress the harm being done to them. So, you know, um, I, con I have constantly asked the question over and over and over, why does DEQ, who is supposed to be the regulatory body uh, in this state, why do they not have the power to stop some of this crap from happening? Why can't they deny permits? And, you know, like Bobby said, and I heard, I think, Rania stated, you know, they will say that they don't have the authority. Well, my question has always been to them, to DQ, if you the regulatory agency and you don't have authority, who the hell got the authority? That's what I want to know. And we've gone to EPA in a Title VI complaint who issued um, a finding in our favor, but that hasn't changed the thing. We entered in a, a mediation with DEQ and we uh, reached an agreement and it still hasn't changed anything. So, you know, what else do we have to do? And, and that's all I have to say right now. Chairman Johnson, one more request to speak. Uh, come speak, please. Elizabeth Haddix. Elizabeth? You've been unmuted. I'm well, I'm not actually muted, but we hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, look, if a lawyer can't figure out how to work the audio on the, this proves that you know folks not all not everybody has access <laughs> um but thank you i wish i could be there with you in person and thank you so much for allowing me to just echo naima's comment um i had thought when i heard bobby jones that nothing more needed to be said in this meeting but um every contribution has been so good one thing that I want you all to know is the advisory board, if you don't know it already, is that in addition to what Naima said about in answer to the chair's question, um, there is no ability to top the power that the industry has over our legislature. And I think if you go to any individual representative who supports these issues, um, you know, representatives Representative um, Harrison, and you know, there's been good legislation introduced to rectify or attempt to rectify some of this. Um, and you know, it's it doesn't even get to be discussed. So, um, in addition, there's no law, right? The Title VI complaint that, that Naima just mentioned, I mean. DEQ told us the same thing, right? We don't have the statutory authority to use an environmental justice analysis in permit. And that's not true. Thank you, too. It's not true. So, so you know, even as lawyers, we fight on these, you know, we, we push these issues in the court. We would be willing to push these issues in the court, but um, you know, what will happen there? So you're right, Chair. The, the public must come out and get in the streets around these issues. And, um, you know, we understand your position as an advisory board. Uh, but there's got to be a way to make this right. And I appreciate Mrs. Sheets' presence here tonight to hold out the example of 
uh, New Jersey. Great. We're all looking forward to seeing those regulations. Thanks. So we have two more. Please. Okay. Um, Donna Travis? Travis, Travis yeah. sorry. Mm -hmm. You're going to mute it. You're muted. Yes. Did you say yes? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I have to say uh, ditto to what was just said, and especially uh, reflecting uh, Naima and uh, Bobby Jones's uh, presentations. I come to you tonight from Pembroke, North Carolina, which is in Robinson County, and uh, many of the statistics that I've heard in terms of uh, cumulative and disproportionate impacts, I could repeat, but I won't. Um, I was uh, actually encouraged uh, when we began with the explanation from um, Attorney Washington about the um, uh, Title VI and the requirements within Title VI. Um, upon um, agencies that receive federal funds. And then um, it's perfect to have that followed up by uh, Charles Lee. And hello, Charles, it's always good to see you, even if it's on video. Um, uh, to have that followed up with the history of cumulative impact, uh, the evolution of the understanding of the importance of cumulative impact within the EPA. So I am troubled because I have had so many attorneys uh, give the opinion that states, not only North Carolina, um, are, required, are required under Title VI um, to, 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 to make the kind of not only the evaluations, which we get good um, environmental impact uh, uh, statements from, from DEQ for any permitting process, but not only to do the studies, but to use those in decision making. And for me, it would be very helpful. Um, we have all heard and and I have, you know, I, I, I have worked uh, with DEQ effectively and in some ways had had successes um, in, in, in some matters with which there's been conversations. But in this case, the statement of we do not have authority is a statement. It's not it's not a um, description of why they do not have the authority. When there are, like I said, so many legal opinions, and we heard those tonight, um, that uh, that says that states in general, but anyone receiving federal funds, but North Carolina in this case specifically, and it would just be very helpful to get. All right, thank you for your comment. Um, up next, we have Liv Hutchby. Um, yes, I, we can I, hear you. I am struggling to share with you the gratitude that I have for this session tonight. You have traveled the distance. You have provided courage and inspiration and you are also allowing us to speak in ways that would tell you and DEQ this is way, way, way past time to be dealt with effectively. And um, as others have said, and we have tried to demonstrate to you, uh, we support you. Whatever resolution or decision that you want to make and uh, addressing the DEQ for the lack of sensitivity, the lack of going by the law itself, for all these permits that we know should not be granted in the first place. Um, all we have to do is tour Tamsa County, if anybody wants to know, some get some more truth telling. Uh, it is just amazing. And so I appreciate the opportunity to say a few words and uh, thank you again for all your courage and let you know that you've got one more uh, two, two legged white old woman supporting you and what you do for truth telling and peacemaking. 
Thank you very much. Dr. Sapper, you want to wrap us up? Uh, uh, I'd like to talk off the record after we finish. Okay. Thank you. We, we, sorry. We accidentally, um, sorry, we have one more. Okay. We got Magnet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Magnet, Virginia, you can unmute it. Yes. Um, I'll be brief because the time is elapsing here. Um, I just like to say that I think most of us of y'all in the meeting and those of us listening, and I'm coming from Pembroke, North Carolina as well. The issue is that we've had for so long is that we find that DEQ is risk averse. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who feel like the state agencies are supposed to represent the people, I particularly and others don't understand why DEQ doesn't take the risk to deny some of these permits and let the companies litigate them if they want to, rather than giving all the permits and leaving it up to us to litigate. And I think the whole system is backwards because the state agencies are supposed to, their mission is to protect, in this case, the environment uh, that affects also our people's health. So I think what we really need to do is really have a serious discussion with all the DEQ staff uh, regarding uh, taking some risks and siding with us and, and see if these companies dare to sue the state and risk uh, the, the courts making some policies that favor us if the legislature won't. And to answer your question, Nikki, we need to do all these strategies, but uh, the legislature is the most difficult. Um, but the administration says, that they're for this, but the agencies that our governors has put in place and the commissions um, aren't, it's either he's not using his influence to impact them or they're not listening. And I'll leave it up to everyone to answer the question they would like. But I just implore our DEQ secretary and this board to really encourage DEQ to quit being so risk averse and stand with the people instead of being afraid of being sued by the companies. Thank you. Let me wrap us up by thanking everybody, including our uh, distinguished guests uh, who joined us virtually tonight and all of you who trekked here to uh, give input and feedback on this very, very important issue. Uh, we have uh, our marching orders in terms of the, the document that we will be preparing and we will take into account all that we've heard this evening and, uh, and think long and hard about next steps. What I will say, uh, and invite everybody to think about, is this idea of uh, business recruitment and how cumulative impact ought to be up front and center in the first instance of who we invite to come to our state. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first, first thing that needs to happen in our state, that we need to be clear and up front about the kinds of industries that we want to accept in our state. What does it mean to come to North Carolina and be a North Carolina citizen for all people? Uh, if we do that very, very well, then we're talking about remediation, not dealing with yeah. continued permitting issues, I think. And so I think we, we started that conversation when we oh, talked to the people that, that do business recruitment and the like. And I think that that's a place that we need to uh, think long and hard about uh, push for policy changes there as well. I thank everybody. Uh, Please be safe in driving home where you're headed this evening. And uh, again, our guests who joined us, thank you very much for your input. Uh, good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.